Thank you, everybody, for showing up. Uh, I think this is a very important piece of history, which is what we are all about. Excuse my voice. Um, but uh, we are all from the uh, Larchmont Historical Fire Company, which is under the Larchmont Historical Society. Um, we've made it our mission to bring about awareness and, and a lot of other things. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to the local parades, but we, the Larchmont Historical Fire Company has, I call it the, the queen. That's, that's my fire truck. Um, I drive it and run it and make it roll all the time. And we have three other pieces of apparatus, uh, a cart, a 1910 brush, the 1922 American La France, which I'm favorite of because my father and my grandfather rode on the back of it. We found it out in Seattle, Washington, brought it back to New York and restored it to the day it was born, literally. No, we put air in the tires, not solid rubber, but a couple other things. It just exactly the day it was born. Anyway, our thing is about history, and we want to keep history alive. That's our mission statement. And uh, part of our mission statement was, on the other hand, if you look at our uniforms, we are almost Civil War type stuff. Which brings us about tonight um, with Professor Ned Benton um, doing the rest of everything, uh, explaining how, you know, the Marinic Civil War, because we're the post Legion, uh, guys joined, died honorably, some dishonorably, but anyway, um, he's got the whole scenario on that. But I just want to thank you all for coming. And uh, I hope this presentation uh, leads on to better things. And you know, it's, it's about an awareness thing. And it, it's really cool if you look into it and where these people came from, where they went, and what they did, and how everything ends up, and where we're going in the future. So I turn it over to Professor Ned Benton, John J. Collins. <laughs> Thank you, PJ. <clears throat> well, welcome to the evening. Um, we're, um, we're, in the end, we'll tell you, uh, when we started to wear these uniforms, we wore them because the hose company in Larchmont wore uniforms like this, and we thought they were cool. But in the course of this research, we figured out why the hose company wore them and then why the person who got the hose company to wear them when they were formed did that and it took us all the way back to the Civil War and we've really discovered that understanding the fire departments in the town of Mamaroneck you can go back to the formation of the villages but if you want to go back further, you really do reach back into a history which is combined with the history of the Civil War. And I'll explain that as we, as we go along. Um, this memorial, this uh, statue is from a memorial at Gettysburg uh, for, the, um, for the, I believe it's the 11th Infantry. Um, uh, regiment, and as you can see, it consists of a Civil War soldier and a firefighter. And there's a reason for that, and I'll be explaining that. But it's it's a beautiful memorial, and one that evokes a lot of uh, a lot of meaning for us. So first, let's just look at a few memorials around uh, our community and notice a couple things about them. Um, this is the village of Larchmont's World War I memorial, and notice that they have a part of the memorial up above that relates to, I'll try my little beeper here, this relates to people who died in the war, and then this relates to people who participated. That's similar to this World War II memorial from Ameranek, which includes people who died and people who participated. 
Now, this is an upstate memorial, potent skill. And it's a VFW Post's memorial. And you'll note, this is the Civil War. This is World War I, World War II, Iraq, and the Vietnam War. That's a pretty big list. And um, it makes you wonder. So here we are. This is an old picture of the Civil War Memorial in New Rochelle. This is, you, you, you'll recognize the memorial, but you won't recognize the context because it's been built up with a lot of other buildings. But a long time ago, it looked like that. But if you go study that memorial, you'll notice that there's nobody's name on it. It is a memorial to those who served and died, but it doesn't identify who they are. And there's a reason for that. And we'll get into that. Now, where is our Mamaroneck Civil War Memorial? I was going to take you on a tour of the community. You know, where's Waldo? Um, there is none, unless one of you knows something more than I do. Usually somebody does and says, yes, there's one in a church somewhere or this. But I have yet to be able to find a Civil War Memorial in Mamaroneck. And some people say it's because, well, there, nobody fought in the Civil War or whatever. There is an explanation. And here it is. This is from a history in 1886 of Westchester County. It's a definitive history. And the history says, I regret much that there is no reliable official record accessible of the names of men, bona fide residents of the different towns in the count, who enlisted therefrom and died in the service. They're saying there's no record of it. In some towns, the patriotism of the people in charge secured such a record. But even then, the papers are, in too many cases, cast aside in a mass of rubbish impossible of extrication. I mean, you know, it, that's just an absolutely astounding thing to say, and that is the record which many, which people have relied on. People have explained this. This has been quoted in history books about Mamaroneck, explaining why we have no memorial and why the records are so unusual. But new technologies are answering old questions. And it's, it's fabulous to be, you know, people think that studying history is about studying the past. It is, but boy, it's also very much immersed in the present. You've got this ability to see things now that you couldn't see in the past. They've digitized the military records of the New York infantries. You can search them. They've scanned town records. They've digitized census records. There are digitized Westchester Cemetery records, and there are digitized genealogical records. And so if we look into the record and investigate, we'll find answers that contradict earlier understandings of the historical record. So let's, for a moment, just set the, the scene for this and go back into the chronology of the Civil War, because it's important to understand. Let's start with the November 1860 election, because when Lincoln ran for president in 1860, in case you didn't know, Westchester voted for the other guy. <laughs> in fact, all of New York City voted for the other guy. The surrounding counties voted for the other guy. And it tells you a little bit of something about their attitude about the war as it developed. I mean, you have to remember that Mamaroneck in 1790, more than 10% of the people in Mamaroneck were slaves of the other 90%. And so this, this was a slave-holding community. We had plantations. And Brooklyn, in 1790, a third of the people were owned by the other two-thirds of the people in Brooklyn. And so, you know, we, there, there's, there's, um, there's a record of slavery in this area 
that didn't exist upstate. Upstate is a very different situation. Um, where in the, at the Underground Railroad, the, slaves, the runaway slaves would come to New York and they'd send them to Syracuse, to Albany, all sorts of places upstate. Um, but they couldn't keep them in New York City. And that's another lecture that's an interesting one. Um, so anyway, we have the attack on Fort Sumter. Lincoln calls for 75,000 militia nationwide for, for three months to suppress the rebellion. We're going to get this done in three months. It's called a, uh, I guess they call it a surge. Uh, we're going we're to figure this out. So New York responds with 30,000 volunteers for two years. So we were very responsive to Lincoln's request. But in the county, there wasn't exactly an enthusiastic response. Now, this is a resolution to the county board, which actually received a lot of sympathetic response. It says, resolved, that no man shall be permitted to leave the county of Westchester for the seat of war unless he shall go voluntarily cheerfully and with a heart for the work. Resolved that the county of Westchester, by resort to her pecuniary resources, has abundant power and ability to achieve this end and that it is both justice and patriotism to do so. Okay, so we're going to buy substitutes. If you don't want to fight in the Civil War, the county will help buy you substitutes. Now, this is a resolution of the town of Newcastle, which I always find an interesting characterization of the situation. Whereas the town of Newcastle has already sent to the field quite a number of volunteers, whereas some eight or ten of them having gotten homesick <laughs> and have returned without leave of their officers to see their friends, those that keep liquor especially, <laughs> And whereas the deputy sheriff has greatly disturbed these visitors and taken some to the provost marshal, the guys that takes them back down to the army, um, and will not allow the remainder to assist us in getting our hay and harvest without giving said visitors great fears, whereas the weather is not good for getting said hay, resolved that a committee of one be appointed by said town to beset Jefferson Davis at Richmond. Said committee be instructed to inform said Jefferson Davis that he's always been his friend and advocate. But unless said Jefferson Davis will grant a secession of hostilities until after haying and harvesting, he, said committee, will stop opposing the draft. I mean, so... I, I read you, I mean, I think it's humorous, but I think it also tells you something about the climate that we existed at the time of the Civil War. Now, 1862, Westchester issues bounty bonds to support soldier families and to pay for substitutes. Furthermore, in 1863, there are draft riots and there's a march on Mount Vernon to burn down the houses of all the Republicans in that place. Uh, so, 1863, there's a real federal draft. And this is the notice that was received by the town board. And it basically says, we want you to enroll in the town of Mamaroneck, County of Westchester, all of the residents residing in the town who are liable to military duty. And they specify everything. So this is going to give us a list of the residents of Mamaroneck. This is from the town. And what happened, the town was really helpful in this, in that they, they really tried to search their old records for documents that would help us to, to understand. And they hadn't located all the documents before, and this was a new record to us. And I'll explain later how this record helps us to understand the record that had previously existed that was flat out incorrect. Here's a page. For example, Halcea William, or William Halcea, a carpenter, 
claims service in Brooklyn. Okay, so he lives in Mamaroneck, but that's his reason for not having to be drafted. Now, um, here's uh, Isaac Hall claims service in New York. Jacob Hall enlisted in the 5th Infantry, in the uh, 5th New York Infantry, the 5th Regiment. So he is a member of the 5th. Remember, we remember the 5th, the 11th, and the 73rd. They're our people, and I'll tell you, they're our, we're, we're, we're part of the, uh, we're part of the 5th. And so anyway, Jacob Hall enlisted in the 5th, so therefore, that information disqualifies him from being drafted because he's already in. So here is Jacob Hall. This is the digitized military records. So here we have his military record indicating that um, he was born in Mamaroneck and he was enlisted in New York City in August 62. And so um, there we have him. Now, what we were trying to do was to construct a list of people who might be on a war memorial for Mamaroneck. And in doing that, we felt it was not our place to make the decisions. Someday, it's your job in the veterans associations with the government officials to figure out who should be on a memorial what we've done is to identify all the candidates that we can find, and we'll tell you the connection, and then you can tell us which connections are worthy and which connections are, 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 are less worthy. But we'll give you the names and the reasons. <coughs> so here we have 14 names of people in that draft enrollment, all with U.S. military muster records. So we have two forms of proof in each instance. We've got them saying that they were in the military or their families saying it in the muster record and we actually have a muster record. So that's our first 14 names. Now, this is another list. This actually appears in a book I just photographed it in the library in, in Larchmont. It's a Mamaroneck history book. And people may have seen this before it's listing Civil War enlistments, and it has a big name of people, and you'll find, for example, that there's a guy from Ireland, a guy from Liverpool, England, two people from France, another one from Germany, um, a guy from Bavaria, um, someone from Springfield, another one from Belgium. I mean, a very peculiar collection of people who went to f be enlisted from Mamaroneck. And you would say, well, these must have been the people for whom we'd gotten the bond, and they were the substitutes for someone. And that's a charitable idea of what this list is, but that's not what it is. <laughs> but it did mislead us in the community for a long time that somewhere in this list was the list of Mamaroneck soldiers. And we just had to figure it out. But this list is a mess. We, we went and looked into these, and we have 33 names, seven are from Mamaroneck, 13 are from Europe, four from other states, seven with no listed birthplace at all, 11 of the 33 have actual New York enlistment records. There are two Mamaroneck soldiers, and we believe that others are bounty jumpers. And we'll explain what bounty jumpers are. The draft of 1863 allowed people to pay a bounty. It actually allowed people to get refunded by the county and by governments to pay this bounty for someone else to fight in their place rather than being, being drafted. Recruiting committees worked with bounty brokers. These were these people who would would recruit people willing to enlist for a bounty and then match them with people who had the funds from the county bonds, etc., to be bountied. Okay? So many were corrupt and they re particularly recruited immigrants 
from the ships as they came into New York Harbor, they would allow the, the bounty brokers to go out to the ships first and explain to them, we've got a job for you right away. <laughs> and, and you know, you can, this is a really good job. You'll see the whole country. Uh, and so, so they would board, so before they even went to Ellis Island, you know, they could say, well, they might scrutinize you at Ellis Island. You don't look like your knee's very good. You know, but if you sign up here, we're going to be able to let you in. We've got a deal for you. Whoops, what did I do? Um, I dropped my little thing, but I better. Okay. Um, so, bounty jumpers were men who enlisted only to collect a bounty and then leave. And they commonly enlisted numerous times in the army, collecting many bounties in the process. The most famous one, John Larney, enlisted and deserted from 93 <laughs> infantries. I mean, he's probably on a whole bunch of Civil War memorials all <laughs> over the state. <laughs> and so we have tried to be very careful. We're going to give you the names that we've vetted. We think that the connection that we assert they have to Mamaroneck is a valid connection. You might still say it's not enough of a connection, but we don't think they're bounty hunters or bounty jumpers. So the next item is New York muster records stating born or enlisted in Mamaroneck. So you're going to see Alfred Willis, Franklin Rocks. I want you to remember this guy, Nicholas Hoyt. Just remember that name because we're going to talk about him a little bit more later. But, but we now have 28 names if we add these people to our list. And here's a roster, for example, this is a roster of the beginning of the 5th Infantry. So all this is in the, it's in the scanned records, you can search all of this. And here is Franklin Rocks, and you can see, born in Mamaroneck. So we don't have a memorial to the soldiers who fought in the Civil War, but we can tell from the military records that there were people born in Mamaroneck who fought in the Civil War. I mean, you know, I mean, we, we had a guy who wasn't on the World War II memorial, who died on a, on a plane uh, out of Saipan. And that was a big issue, and people have, it's almost now on, on, on all the memorials, there's a couple more, but People felt very badly about that. I mean, it was just a mix-up at the end of the war, and, and the, the, the mother had moved to New Rochelle, and New Rochelle thought Mamaroneck or Larchmont did it, Larchmont thought you know, New Rochelle, but people felt very, but what if I told you there were 60 of these people? You know, I mean, people would feel, you know, but this is the situation. And it's not, it's not the fault of our leaders in government now, it's a different generation. It's a generation of leaders in the latter part of the 1800s who should have done something about it, and now it's the responsibility of our generation to correct the record and do what should have been done by that generation. Here's Samuel Murdoch. He's enlisted in Mamaroneck right there. So here are, here's a th another source. Um, you had mentioned that you'd done that in another, the records are our, that are Westchester County um, cemetery records. And so these are in the Mamaroneck bur burial ground. Uh, Lucius B. Watson is in the Jedney Cemetery in Rye Neck. In the Disbro Cemetery is David Disbro. And there are more people in some, there are in other cemeteries in the county that are listed as having resided in Mamaroneck. Now, this is an interesting person that we come upon this way. Frederick Anderson 
died in 1926. He was living at 19 Mayhew, and I got, uh, thanks to uh, Lynn, the, uh, the records from the, uh, this, is, this is the county tax record of this house uh, sometime after he died, but, um, but we stuck it up there. Um, and uh, he was a Civil War vet who was living with his father. But there's something a little bit unusual about this record if you look carefully at the bottom. <laughs> He's probably the last Civil War veteran to reside in Larchmont, and he fought on the other side. <laughs> now, as I said, I give you all the names, and you can decide. <laughs> uh, but we're, this is a definite Larchmont connection, but he enlisted on the other side. And so the hard choices will have to fall to, uh, um, to, uh, to the people prepared to make the decision. Now, we then have an 1893 cent census of Civil War veterans. And so that's another effort to identify veterans. And so there are people and uh, they're indicated on the record whether they are, they're uh, living in New York and in, in Mamaroneck. And so these would be veterans who might have been somewhere else but had come to live in Mamaroneck in their old years. And um, so um, Thomas Coles also appears, he's in this record, but he also appears in the 1863 enlistment record. Uh, so some of the people we have multiple records of. Now, these are people then who were living in Mamaroneck Town in 1890. They're people who have an actual record, I have their, uh, their record, and they're certified by the census as living in Mamaroneck Town in 1890. So that gives us another group of people that we can consider putting on a memorial. So here's the summary. We have 61 total veterans uh, from the draft enrollments, enlistments, muster records, cemetery records, and census records, and other records, total, vet uh, total veterans, two of whom died while in military service, and nobody is on a memorial. Nobody. So. What do we do about a memorial? Well, um, we, we thought that what we would do is to make a, it's in the back. It's a framed paper memorial from which we can add names and delete names until the memorial's been around enough. People have looked at it, sort of digested it, and we're prepared to say that this is the list we're gonna go with or some other list. Then we can decide to do something um, but right now you have a memorial, and any organization that would like a Civil War memorial will give you a memorial for free. You know, there's one at Flint Park. There's a, in, in the building, there's, there's, a, uh, uh, there's one. And, any, and any, if, if any organization, any government, any veterans organization that wants a copy of this will we'll, we'll give it to you, and if a name is added or deleted or some action is taken, we'll come and update it. Now, here is an interesting person who fought in the Civil War who has a Larchmont Mamaroneck connection. His name is Charles McKnight Lesser. And this, he is right here. I believe this is him right here. Um, in, um, and this is Colonel Ellsworth, who was the first m major casualty of the North in the Civil War. Um, and this is from his Civil War graduation, his uh, U.S. Military Academy graduation picture. I teach in the spring on, uh, in, at, the, uh, at West Point. And so I, I teach at the Army Education Center in a master's program for the staff and for other, other people in the area. And, um, and so they helped me locate these records of Charles McKnight Lesser. And uh, this is a commendation of him. 
and it's actually, we have it in the back. It tells all about him. He's quite a remarkable person. Um, and he died, whoops, he died in Larchmont Manor in 1896. Now the interesting thing about Charles McKnight Lesser is that he was in charge of the 11th Infantry for a while. Um, and they fought, you know, they, they, um, they were a, uh, an, an important infantry. And they were the first fire zouave infantry. And what does that mean? A fire zouave infantry, it was a way of, there were actually southern fire zouave infantries too, and they were from all kinds of states. What the recruiters would do is to go to the, the fire departments were volunteer fire departments. Um, they would go to the volunteer companies and they'd say, we will recruit you um, as, a, as a command, as, as a unit, with the command structure that your fire company has. So if they were to recruit the historical fire company, Ray would be our commander and we'd be sent down south. Um, and, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and so, and so the, the, the 5th, the 11th, and the 7th, 73rd were the fire zouave companies of New York. Um, and Lesser was in charge of one. Um, he ended up, um, he, he fought in the Civil War. He ended up at one point being captured. He ended up um, coming back. And then um, he was in charge of the, um, the, the Veterans Association. Well into the um, 1880s, he was in charge of the Civil War Veterans Association in New York and um, spoke very highly of his, um, of his company. Anyway, he lived in Larchmont. He lived in the manor house. And he published a newsletter about liquor. It was like the, the liquor store newsletter. And he actually, it was interesting, I wondered what he thought about prohibition. He actually advocated in favor of prohibition. But his idea of prohibition was that it should eliminate beer because beer was a low and uh, a very, uh, he, uh, he said that it was, um, um, that he, this confession, he says a saloon is a moral leper and social reprobate in any community. It is gross, obscene, vulgar, and profane. It is the home of gamblers and other criminals and the resort of prostitutes. Its decorations are immodest, indecent, and suggestive. We really need to have a, 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 uh, a, a, a historical society event in a, uh, in a Charles Lesser saloon. You know? <laughs> With these facts before us, there is no middle ground, no room for sentimentalism, no basis for compromise. It is a place of unadulterated evil right downstairs below us. The so-called ideal solution does not exist it is merely an imagination, but the idea was that the higher spirits and wines, they were, of course, perfectly acceptable, and that prohibition should be about eliminating saloons and beer. Anyway, this is a picture of a, of a fire zouave company. And you can see the, they dressed in these zouave uniforms, and, um, and um, they are the inspiration for, <laughs> for the historical fire company with our historical fire engine and our flaming helmets. And we didn't understand why we, we did this because the hose company did it when we decided we wanted our uniform to be like the hose company uniform. We didn't know why the hose company did it. Lesser was part of the hose company. And when the fire department was formed in the 1890s, he was in Larchmont, and he was the leader of a former Zouave company. And I'm reasonably sure that if we could trace the records of the hose company, Charles Lesser would have told them, here's your uniform. If you really want to be classy, and that was the classy company, if you want to be classy, that's what you want to do. And I bet he might have been a member, except I've never been able to find a record of it. 
Um, there were lots of zouave units. I mean, it is so the print gets so small. Um, the, but the big ones were the 5th, the 11th, and the 73rd. Now, the 5th Infantry. This is their memorial at Gettysburg, and this is their flag. Now, the 5th Infantry, um, you can see a whole set of different battles they were in. You can see the number of people they lost. Um, and uh, they were a, they, they were a very, very busy um, infantry before they were disbanded. Um, this is the 11th Infantry's flag where, it, where in the process of getting an artist to, paint, to sketch this for us, to paint this for us so we can then actually create more lively and contemporary, um, I mean not contemporary but historically accurate um, we want to put this on the engine because it really, this is, if you look carefully at it, this is firefighting equipment. This is the oil for the helmet that we have in the back. This is a fire helmet here. And yet here there are, are um, anyway, it's, it's, it's a, a flag for a military company but it's actually consisting of firefighting equipment because they're fire zouaves. Now this is the 11th Infantry. They didn't last as long, but they had some very significant battles. They did. Um, and here are some pictures of, the, uh, of some fire zouaves um, in the Civil War. Um, and this is the 73rd Infantry's memorial. The big picture is the memorial. It's very high up. I think this is the most evocative. If I could have my wish for a memorial in Mamaroneck, I would try to get a replication of that. Because what it says is that our, because I think it's true, that many of our soldiers had a relationship to the fire service. And it would it would it would describe it would describe our history. It would embody our history in a beautiful way. I don't. I mean, by now it's not copyrighted. We could get someone to make it, but it's a it's a fabulous statue, which I think would be something like this. You know, maybe who knows? But anyway, this is at Gettysburg. This is at Gettysburg. It is the memorial at Gettysburg. You know, it's got memorials all over the battlefield. And this is the 11th Infantry's memorial, a uh, 73rd Infantry's memorial. The 73rd, this was a workhorse infantry. They were in all kinds of battles. And so you can trace this chart. I put dates of incidents in the Civil War next to the, the, um, the period in which these three fire zouave companies that were most of our soldiers um, were. And so you can see them at, um, um, you know, First Bull Run and, and Seven Pines and Malvern Hill and Antietam and uh, Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville. And you can see our soldiers, you know, Mamaroneck is represented throughout the entire war in all of the pivotal battles. And you can see that the 73rd, they just went on and on and on. Over here you can see when, on, in 1864, this is when Lesser is imprisoned, Colonel Lesser. And um, Lesser is then exchanged in 65. Um, now, I told you about Nicholas Hoyt. Nicholas Hoyt signed up. Now we can, you know, when, the, when they said that nobody should go without a heart for the, for the work, Nicholas Hoyt enlisted before there was any talk of a draft. You know, he was a fisherman. He had a family. He enlisted, and I can't say why he, you know, but he, he, he chose to enlist on his own volition. And uh, he, um, this is showing him with his wife and his son. And um, um, 
And um, this is uh, actually Nicholas in the 1850s in Rye. Here is his wife and hi him, his wife Susan, and his four children in Mamaroneck. He's a fisherman in Mamaroneck in the Mamaroneck census in 1860. So there's no question that he was here. Absolutely no question that he was here. This is his muster record. It says in his military record, he was born in Mamaroneck, New York. No doubt about it. Um, he was in the second battle of Bull Run. I mean, he was in a huge battle. I mean, that, you know, that was, a, was a, a, an extraordinary battle. And, um, and um, he was in the battle right after the battle, promoted to corporal. So he must have done a remarkable job in the battle. And he's someone from Mamaroneck that we have good reason to be proud of him. You know, even if he just, if he, he didn't get promoted in battle, we have reason to be proud of him. But if there's any doubt that this man deserves to be honored by this community, he got promoted at Bull Run. I mean, what do we want? He was also in Burnside's Mud March. Now, this was a march on, um, at um, Fredericksburg that Lincoln told Burnside not to do. But Burnside wanted to show Lincoln that he was wrong. Burnside went ahead and did it and marched the soldiers into a swamp in a snowstorm, and their horses were injured and killed, their carts were stuck in the mud, they were a sitting target for the northern shoulders, they couldn't move, they were stuck, and furthermore, in those days, when you got pneumonia, I mean, you were done. They didn't have something to give you that helped you get better, and so, this was a dreadful situation, and Burnside was fired by Lincoln for doing this. And it was right. He should have been fired for doing this. This is Nicholas Hoyt's grave marker, N.H. Hoyt, New York, in the, at the Fredericksburg National Cemetery. He died in the hospital there of illness that he got at the mud march. I mean, he was promoted at Bull Run, marched into the mud by Burnside, gets a disease, and dies in a hospital. I mean, it's a, it's a tragedy of a, of a heroic man. So, let's have some more proof. This is his wife's widow's benefits in Mamaroneck, New York. Okay, this is this is this was his the um, it, this is this is a, a record showing that she lived in Mamaroneck, New York, and she received these widow's benefits. The family received widow's benefits in Mamaroneck, New York. Now here is a map of Mamaroneck in 1867. And if you look over here, see you've got the trail, the, uh, the train tracks, and if you look over here, you'll notice that there's a street here that hadn't yet been created. There's a street that goes now where the train station is. You can, there's an avenue that sometimes people might mention uh, that's actually the subject of some development now because of a uh, focus. Well, let's look at an 1872 map and look at the name of this avenue that was created right after the Civil War. Hoyt Avenue. I mean, they named the Darn Avenue after Nicholas Hoyt. They created it right after the Civil War. His wife was living in the community as a widow 
and he was a war hero, they named the avenue after him and then forgot. There's absolutely no record of the history of naming the avenue that we've been able to find. You know, when they talk about the records being in a pile and nobody can figure out what they mean, well, some of the records are, and this is one of them, but it's plainly obvious that it was for him. So, um, well, we have in the back, we have in the back a resolution that we want to propose, and anybody who wants to go to any of our governments, I mean, I think the town, since the town was the, the I mean, really, the village should do it in part because the village owns the road, is, is responsible for Hoyt Avenue now. The town should also do it because it was their avenue when it was created and he was their resident at the time. But we've assembled a document and voted on it it's behind PJ over there, um, it's, it's, uh, but you can pick it up. It's got all the evidence for rededicating Hoyt Avenue in honor of Colonel Nicholas, of, 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 of uh, Corporal Nicholas Holt, just in case we forgot. And, yes, every time when we march by that, we always offer a little salute, and people don't understand why we're saluting a street sign. But when we are in the Mamaroneck parades and, and, and the historical fire company marches by, we honor Mr. Hoyt. So, uh, yes, we've done that too. It's probably, <laughs> you know, it's the, the ghost of, Cur of Corporal Hoyt. Um, a Civil War memorial for which soldiers? Our policy as to what we did was to be intentionally inclusive. Um, we accept documents asserting a relationship. Uh, we recognize that soldiers deserve to be honored sometimes by more than one community. We don't think we need to worry whether someone's name is on some memorial somewhere else too. If the person lived in both communities, good for both communities. They both have the opportunity to honor somebody. But we list here the records, and I've gone through them so I won't repeat them, but the kinds of records that we believe establish the connection. And we have, as I said, created a temporary memorial which we will put up and maintain anywhere where, in, where we're invited to do it. And at a time when there is confidence that the Civil War memorial list is complete, we believe that one or more physical memorials should be created, and we believe that a site near Hoyt Avenue should be considered. Yes? I just thought I heard PJ say, everything on the right-hand side going down Hoyt from Fenimore Road is owned by the Metro North? I believe so. That's, that's All the way down. Well, so so something on the left hand side where all of the well, we're talking half time there. Yeah, around half time there. Yeah. Well, not the but but you've that's got the, the, the park area. there too. I don't think it, I think I mean, in the area the that's a gorgeous park. But could all this park be too far? No, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think this is not a memorial to Hoyt. But I do think a proximity to Hoyt Avenue is a good idea. That's all I think. Because I know, I know that in front of the train station is designated a uh, site, the original train station, not the one on top, the original one on the bottom. Yeah. So we could do something. Well, that would be banks, cool. On the banks of the shelter, I guess it is. That would be cool. But in any case, these are things that are, are above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that people, you know, in the community and, and the veterans need to figure this out. But we, we are here to be your help. But not losing the sight that we also got to remember that when we first started looking into this stuff, we looked for Lloyd Park originally. Nobody showed up because Lloyd Park did not exist. I know, right. Well, right. the Maranek Village didn't exist either. Yeah. So this was the inspiration. This is actually Hose Company's memorial. 
And this was the inspiration for the idea of creating what we created. We'd seen something like this before, and we thought that we could do something like it. So that's the memorial that we've created. You can see it in the back. It lists all of the people. It even includes Mr. Anderson <laughs> from the Confederate Army. <laughs> and you can, and, um, and, um, uh, but it includes everybody I've listed, and it has the, uh, the, the, um, the um, I, what did I say that was? Was that the 11th? Flag. The flag? The flag. The flag. Yeah, the 11th flag up there. I like that flag. And so that's the, um, that's the end of our story. Yeah. Uh, yes, questions. Uh, questions. I mean, that's, that's in your territory, not mine, but I'm very interested. I'd that really love to know. That was a Civil War armament. It was a, wow. Right before Shell at the end of Barry and Post Road. That wow. used to be the property of uh, the school. That used to, that actually, there used to be a, a mark, a state still mark. There's still there. Still there. Still there. Yeah, yeah, it was I, a train. I, my question is, um, I think in Gettysburg, Oh, yes, we do. Yes, every, every person. This, this memorial lists the inventory. The, this is, for example, this says 5th Infantry, and these are the people. Here's the 11th, here's the, you know, and so forth, and you get so, we even have someone in the Navy. But why then don't we have the names of the people from around here? We do. That's the whole idea. That's Well, I figured it out from the records, but they didn't have the records. I mean, they digitized them right. within the last 10 years. Right. And so from that, I've been able to say... Yes, but remember That's that the inventory, the infantries, remember that at the time of the Civil War, there was not a U.S. Army. Okay. There was a Navy that was U.S., but the armies were all states. So that's why you have like the 16th okay. Connecticut yeah. Infantry. They were assigned to the federal government, but they were the state's army. So we have lots of infantries, all these numbers of infantries, and then there are reserve infantries, and the diamonds, all kinds of things. But, right, and, there, and many of them have a fire Zawab connection, but what I'm saying is that these ones are the big ones that are known as the fires of wild ones. Okay. And furthermore, um, you know, people from, we've got people in all kinds of infantries on this list. Mamaroneck soldiers were in many infantries of New York, but the biggest one, the biggest number was in the fifth. Okay. And Nicholas Hoyt was in the fifth. And we know that the fifth and the 11th and the 73rd they actually have records of doing recruiting in this part of the, uh, in Westchester. They came up to Westchester to do recruiting. And so we know there are infantries, yes. Was Lester in the 5th and was he present when Ellsworth got killed? He was promoted when Ellsworth got killed, but he was in the 11th. Ellsworth was in, was in charge of the 11th. So he wasn't there? Yes, he was. Yes. Yes. He was there, and he would. That picture is him and Ellsworth just before Ellsworth was killed. The picture that I showed you. 
So he was third in command, then he became second in command, and then he became first in command because the people above him kept being killed. And so then, you know, then um, that, was the, that was the story. And he lived, I mean, he's a guy, he, he graduates from West Point, not that, I mean, you can see from the picture, you're not that old, and is suddenly made third in command to Ellsworth's infantry. And they're down there. And then he gets promoted. Uh, you know, he's, um, he's a very interesting man, and right behind you, you can read all about him. That whole, that's a whole bunch of information about him, including the ad and including the citation. The citation about him is remarkable. It tells about his military record. And he lived in Larchmont, but Larchmont's part of the town of Mamaroneck. You know, hearts were stuck in the mud. They were a sitting target for the northern soldiers. They couldn't move. They were stuck. And furthermore, in those days, when you got pneumonia, I mean, you were done. They didn't have something to give you that helped you get better. And so this was a dreadful situation, and Burnside was fired by Lincoln for doing this. And it was right. He should have been fired for doing this. This is Nicholas Hoyt's grave marker. N.H. Hoyt, New York. In the, at the Fredericksburg National Cemetery. He died in the hospital there of illness that he got at the Mud March. I mean, he was promoted at Bull Run, marched into the mud by Burnside, gets a disease, and dies in a hospital. I mean, it's a, it's a tragedy of a, of a heroic man. So, Let's have some more proof. This is his wife's widow's benefits in Mamaroneck, New York. Okay, this is this is this was his the um, it, this is this is a, a record showing that she lived in Mamaroneck, New York, and she received these widow's benefits. The family received widow's benefits in Mamaroneck, New York. Now. Here is a map of Mamaroneck in 1867. And if you look over here, see you've got the trail, the, uh, the train tracks. And if you look over here, you'll notice that there's a street here that hadn't yet been created. There's a street that goes now where the train station is. You can, there's an avenue that sometimes people might mention that's actually the subject of some development now because of a focus? Well, let's look at an 1872 map and look at the name of this avenue that was created right after the Civil War. Hoyt Avenue. I mean, they named the Darn Avenue after Nicholas Hoyt. They created it right after the Civil War his wife was living in the community as a widow, and he was a war hero. They named the avenue after him, and then forgot. There's absolutely no record of the history of naming the avenue that we've been able to find. You know, when they talk about the records being in a pile and nobody can figure out what they mean. Well, some of the records are, and this is one of them, but it's plainly obvious that it was for him. So, um, well, we have in the back, we have in the back a resolution that we want to propose, anybody, anybody who wants to go to any of our governments, I mean, I think the town, since the town was the, the, I mean, really, the village should do it in part because the village owns the road, is, is responsible for Hoyt Avenue now. The town should also do it because it was their avenue when it was created and he was their resident at the time. But we've assembled a document and voted on it it's behind PJ over there. Um, 
It's, it's, uh, but you can pick it up. It's got all the evidence for rededicating Hoyt Avenue in honor of Colonel Nicholas, of, uh, of, of uh, Corporal Nicholas Holt, just in case we forgot. And, yes, every time when we march by that, we always offer a little salute, and people don't understand why we're saluting a street sign. But when we are in the Mamaroneck parades and, and, and the historical fire company marches by, we honor Mr. Hoyt. So, uh, yes, we've done that too. It's probably, <laughs> you know, it's the, the ghost of, Cur of Corporal Hoyt. Um, a Civil War memorial for which soldiers? Our policy as to what we did was to be intentionally inclusive. Um, we accept documents asserting a relationship. Uh, we recognize that soldiers deserve to be honored sometimes by more than one community. We don't think we need to worry whether someone's name is on some memorial somewhere else too. If the person lived in both communities, good for both communities, they both have the opportunity to honor somebody. But we list here the records, and I've gone through them so I won't repeat them, but the kinds of records that we believe establish the connection. And we have, as I said, created a temporary memorial which we will put up and maintain anywhere where, in, where we're invited to do it. And at a time when there is confidence that the Civil War memorial list is complete. We believe that one or more physical memorials should be created. And we believe that a site near Hoyt Avenue should be considered. Yes? I just thought I heard PJ say everything on the right hand side going down Hoyt from Fenimore Road is owned by the McDonald's. I believe so. Well, so so something on the left hand side where all of the well, we're talking half time there. Yeah, around half time there. Yeah. Well, not the but but you've that's got the, the, the park area. there too. I don't think I think it's in the, the area park. that's a gorgeous park. Well, could all this park be too far? No, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think this is not a memorial to Hoyt. But I do think a proximity to Hoyt Avenue is a good idea. That's all I think. Because I know, I know that in front of the train station is designated a uh, site, an original train station, not the one on top, the original one on the bottom. Yeah. So we could do something. Well, that would be bank, cool. On the banks of the shelter, I think it is. That would be cool. But in any case, these are things that are, are above my pay grade. <laughs> <laughs> there are things that people, you know, in the community and, and the veterans need to figure this out. But we, we are here to be your help. But not losing the site that we also got to remember that when we first started looking into this stuff, we looked for Large Mart originally. Nobody showed up because Large Mart did not exist. I know, right. Well, the Maranek Village didn't exist either. Yeah. So was, was this was the inspiration. This is actually Hose Company's memorial. And this was the inspiration for the idea of creating what we created. We'd seen something like this before, and we thought that we could do something like it. So that's the memorial that we've created. You can see it in the back. It lists all of the people. It even includes Mr. Anderson <laughs> from the Confederate Army. <laughs> and you can, and um, and um, uh, but it includes everybody I've listed, and it has the uh, the the um, the um, I, what did I say that was? Was that the eleventh? The flag. The flag. 11. Yeah, the eleventh flag up there. I like that flag. And so that's the um, that's the end of our story. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, questions. Besides, questions. Besides the uh, Confederate thing, I'd like to know more about on Barry Avenue where the original American Legion was, across from now is the Donuts. Yes, yes. Yeah. That was at one time the Civil War. Really? It was an armory. It was an armory. It was an armory and a field. Wow, we should be able to find the.
uh, we should be able to find, that's something to look into. I mean, that's, that's in your territory, not mine. But I'm very interested. I'd Sam really love to know. Was a Civil War armament. It was a wow. It's a right to report shell at the end of Barry and Post Road. Wow. That used to be the property of uh, the school. That used to that actually there used to be a, a mark, a state mark. Still, 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 still there. Yeah. yeah. My, my question is, um, I think in Gettysburg recently, and I saw all the New York like from. All these memorials, and I was like, wow, I didn't know all these things. These people, they're not necessarily like you showed infantry that might be from around, like, but we don't have any records of the actual infantry that they were in in these memorials. Oh, yes, we do. Or, yes, every, every person. This, this memorial lists the inventory, the, this is for example, this the says 5th Infantry, and these are the people. Here's the 11th, here's the, you know, and so forth, and you get, so, we even have someone in the Navy. But why then don't we have the names of the people from around here? We do, that's the whole idea. That's, you figured that out. There were records. Well, I figured it out from the records, but they didn't have the records. I mean, they digitized them within the last 10 years. And so from that, I've been able to say... Yes, but remember That's that the inventory, the infantries, remember that at the time of the Civil War, there was not a U.S. Army. Okay. There was a Navy that was U.S., but the armies were all states. So that's why you have like the 16th okay. Connecticut okay. Infantry. Mm -hmm. They were assigned to the federal government, but they were the state's army. So we have lots of infantries, all these numbers of infantries, and then there are reserve infantries, and the diamonds, all kinds of things. But, right, and, there, and many of them have a fire zawab connection, but what I'm saying is that these ones are the big ones that are known as the fire zawab ones. Okay. And furthermore, um, you know, people from We've got people in all kinds of infantries on this list. Mamaroneck soldiers were in many infantries of New York, but the biggest one, the biggest number was in the 5th. Okay. And Nicholas Hoyt was in the 5th. And we know that the 5th and the 11th and the 73rd, they actually have records of doing recruiting in this part of the, uh, in Westchester. They came up to Westchester to do recruiting. And so we know there are infantries. Yes? Was Lesser in the 5th, and was he present when Ellsworth got killed? He was promoted when Ellsworth got killed, but he was in the 11th. Ellsworth was in, was in charge of the 11th. So he wasn't there? Yes, he was. He was in Alexandria? Yes. The beginning of the war? Yes. Well, he was there, and he would, that picture, is him and Ellsworth just before Ellsworth was killed. The picture that I showed you. See, he was third in command, then he became second in command, and then he became first in command because the people above him kept being killed. And so then, you know, then um, that, was the, that was the story. And he lived, I mean, he's a guy, he, he graduates from West Point, not that, I mean, you can see from the picture, you're not that old, and he suddenly made third in command to Ellsworth's infantry. And they're down there. And then he gets promoted. Uh, you know, he's, um, he's a very interesting man, and right behind you, you can read all about him. That whole, that's a whole bunch of information about him, including the ad and including the citation. The citation about him is remarkable. It tells about his military record. And he lived in Larchmont, but Larchmont's part of the town of Mamaroneck, you know, and, and his service was the town of Mamaroneck. He was, he was in the town when he served. And, um, and um, so he's one of ours. But, uh, you no, know, we have people we can be very proud of. There were no battles in this area, so to speak. I know sometimes no. things like No, in the Revolutionary War there were battles up here. Okay. 
but in the, in, the, in, the, in the Civil War, it didn't get up here. Yeah, okay. Yes. How long did it take you to do your research to compile the list? Years? No, it didn't. It actually, um, it kind of. What it's these kind? These are ideas that I had for a long time, but they never gelled. I remember going over. I did at one point a site for the historical society. That that is a a war memorial site, which has pictures of our local war memorials, and you. You can have this list of the people, and you can click through, and you get a record of each person. And so I'd done Vietnam, and I went back to Korea, and I went back to World War II and World War I. And you know, I, 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 I wanted to get back to the Civil War. And I went over to the town, and I said, you know, where's the, and they showed me that thing with the people from Germany and all this stuff. And I couldn't make head or tail of it. And so they said it was very confusing. They didn't know what to believe. They think a lot of thought of the people were bounty people and so on, but they didn't. And so, so I stopped. And then at one point I started to try and do this with the Revolutionary War, and it became suddenly evident there were all this evidence of slavery that I really sort of stopped. I, I, the memorial thing was in good shape. Incidentally, we have the, there is a, book of World War I, soldiers, it's a, it's a military book about soldiers of the Great War, and it has no index, and we have scanned the book, and we have it on the website indexable, so that people, and it's a, it's a statewide resource, it, it's listed in the state uh, um, as, the, as, the, as, the, as the way you can access the soldiers of the Great War and find out whether there are pictures and records of your soldiers from World War I available. And How you know, it's on the Larchmont Historical Society website. Larchmonthistory.org. Same, Larchmonthistory.org. And if you go to the Mamaroneck History site, it'll, it's got a link. I mean, all of us, we link to each other. Um, but, you know, we have the slavery project and we just, the slavery in Mamaroneck Township project was released earlier this month from John Jay. We scaled it up and we got a whole bunch of students to work on it and it's the New York Slavery Records Index. And it's got, it's got a giant database behind it, it's an engine. It's got 37,000 records of slavery in New York State, naming the names, and it's doing a lot of other things. We've got all of the slave ship investors from 1715 to 1765, and we proved that John Jay, this the president of our college wasn't exactly pleased with this, we proved that John Jay's father and his grandfather were slave ship investors. Ooh. I mean, but we've got the names of them all. They, you know, the uh, Delanceys are big slaveholders, and we've got the Delanceys investing in slave ships. Uh, you know, we've got, you know, we've got, a, you know, but now what we could do for the Maranac Township, now you can do, we have 2,500 records for Albany. And so the Albany Times Union is doing a, uh, a, a whole series on this. They were, they, it was like they were scratching their, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean, what do you mean? And now they've got all these records. And, um, and it's really all coming from the work that we've done that um, was the, just different kinds of projects. But, but this one was a, it was the commitment of the historical fire company to try, try, they kept saying, yeah, that's, we know about Larchmont this, and we know about Mamaroneck that, and we know about the creation of the villages. What happened before then? Who were the firefighters before then? And I believe that Nicholas Hoyt was a volunteer firefighter in Mamaroneck because that's who joined the 5th Infantry. And so I think we found ourselves one of our volunteer firefighters. Yes and yes. Can you call up your other members and the members of the Historical Society and maybe take a photo of all these guys? Would you mind that? Before you do that.
it's been done, but yes, we're certainly willing. We have, we have leaders of the Larchmont Historical Society and the Mamaroneck Historical Society together, and we ought to put that together too, yes. The time that you and I talked to right now, most of the thing on point wasn't So what you did in one year is amazing. Yeah, well, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're proud of what you did. I'm like you, I'm into it, and you said to me, boy, that's the only point I ever heard was Hoyt Avenue. And that's how the whole thing started. And you didn't even have any of this records or anything else like that. No, we I didn't. Think. We didn't. We didn't have it all. Yeah, we were. We were working on it. Yeah. Well, I think there really is a rich and wonderful history of Mamaroneck soldiers in the Civil War, and I think that as this whole process of digitization goes on, you know, ten years from now we can come back and tell a whole new chapter of the story. And I, you know, it's our, our, you know, our history, yeah. it used to be the history was something that was sort of like chiseled in stone, and then we moved on and we'll chisel some more history. But now history keeps recreating. You know, it, the, the truth becomes, you know, it, 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 uh, it becomes. Yep. Yes, right. Yep, 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 yep. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming and listening. <laughs> Professor Ned Benton, John Jay College, oh, a historian of our company, we thank him a lot. <laughs>